two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, we're live. Not uh, only two minutes late this week. That's mostly my fault. Um, mostly, John. John. John here was. We're all good. <laughs> I, I contributed to the uh, Everybody, good good evening. Welcome to another episode of Den of Lore. I do not have a uh, motivational uh, speech this week, uh, although I did want to make a somewhat of an announcement. I'm going to be moving, and I'm in the process of um, uh, renovating the house. So, uh, in the next couple of weeks, possibly the next month or so. I'll be doing the show for my laptop as the new studio that I just built is going to be disassembled <laughs> within the next couple of days. Uh, so there may be a slightly different background on en environ, uh, if you will. Um, but I'm going to do my best and, and, you know, we're just going to keep rolling. I just may be doing it for my laptop from my kitchen table. So, you know, here you go. But, uh, on today's program, uh, welcoming back to the show and almost actually a year, uh, or not a year. The last time we had you on was episode, sure. was it one nineteen? It was, it was like four or five years ago, basically yeah, to the day. Years. Yeah. And, uh, welcoming John Cadman, uh, back onto the show. And so John as as is, uh, tradition, I will be giving you your intro. Uh, written, as written by chat GPT. Hopefully it's a little more accurate this time. Uh, in, introducing her guest on today's show, John Cadman, a good longtime friend of the show. Uh, John is an engineer and inventor who has dedicated his career to unlocking the mysteries of the great pyramid of Giza. His groundbreaking work has led to a deeper understanding of the pyramids inner workings and how it was constructed. John's research focuses on the subterranean section of the Great Pyramid, which he believes is the key to unlocking its secrets. He has built the first and only working model of this section, which demonstrates that there was a water machine under the pyramid that produced the sonic force to drive it. John's work builds upon the visions of other great minds, including Edward, I'm going to butcher his name, Kunkel? Knuckle? That's it. Kunkel. Chris Dunn. Stephen Mel uh, Stephen Meller, who's also been on the show uh, in ages past, and Joe Parr, whom I do not believe I've had the opportunity to meet. He, he's passed since. Oh well, man. Well, that's unfortunate. Hey, hey, but still, <laughs> oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> <clears throat> His model integrates these different perspectives into a cohesive whole, showing how they all fit together to form a complete picture of the pyramid's construction and function. Through his research, John has raised many questions as he has answered. But one thing is clear. His work has pushed the boundaries of what we know about the Great Pyramid and opened up new avenues for exploration and discovery. Join us today as we delve into John's fascinating research and learn more about the mysteries of the Great Pyramid. John, welcome back into the Den of Lore. Uh, for your honor, did I lose it? Oh. <clears throat> I cracked open my bottle of Macallan 12, so cheers to you, sir. <laughs> He's got a dram glass. <clears throat> a white glass? A dram. It's a glass. dram. Oh, yes. My, uh, I, I have a bottle of scotch. Oh. But I'm, I'm the brother, Mike, that, that helps where I can. <laughs> and I have, I have a nice... Uh, Graham glass like you have. Well, thank you very much. That that's always good to hear. How how have you been? You you weren't on the last two times, but I have been following. Okay. It was in the background. I I do the, the camera. I, I do the camera. I do the sound. <laughs> I do all the the stuff. The the lighting changes and things in the background. So, um, well, I'm the man behind the camera. You can always just so. say I'm the good looking one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I, I gotta say, uh, it's... Uh, you back, back to John. Well, uh, you, you can both be on. It's it's totally up to yeah, you. This is this is like a way more relaxed show. Than... Yes, it, it, this is chill zone right now. We're fine. We're happy. And okay. I uh, for everyone out there, I did make sure because I know the last time you were on, and it was amazing because you just gotten it working. But for like two hours, just thump, 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 thump. So I'm like, <laughs> can we talk about the machine, but maybe not have the machine running? So. Um, but it's still, it is amazing that it is, is running and has been running all these years. And I know that the, um, uh, per, I'm going to say perspective, the, the attention has uh, shifted more towards 
wow, this actually works from that's never going to work or you're wrong about that. Uh, and I, it, it's, it's awesome to see because basically I've been watching it being built in pseudo real time along with anybody else who follows your, your Facebook page. And it, it's, uh, you know, for, from, from one computer guy and tinkerer to another, like that, that's just absolutely amazing. So first, yeah, you know, first yeah. off, and the fact that you rope your brother into it as well, and he's like, we're going to build some stuff. And he's like, I got to make sure you don't die. So, okay, I guess it's fine. <laughs> So, there's a lot of truth to that. What? That's funny. That, there's a lot of truth to that. Just gotta make sure you don't die. <laughs> uh, uh, my brother John has roped me into a lot of things over since we've been re- very little, and it's it's oh. done from like electronics to motocross to you name it. Uh, we've been sort of roped into these things. I tried to and, get him to the Bering Sea and I failed. No, I, I chose the military instead. I'd rather be shot at than uh, going out on the Bering Sea where it's just miserable. Well, yeah, well you, you you guys were crabbers before. I know I know John, John was, was John was, I, I was. But so like I, are, are are we talking like deadliest catch style crabber? Yes, yes, yeah. In fact, the boat I was chief on was uh, on the oh. first season. But I was on before Deadliest Catch was there, and it was all with all the camera crews and cameras. And so the skippers were way meaner because <laughs> they could get away with yeah. it. They're, they're, they're serious. And the Norwegian ones are even, they're the worst. Well, as far as mean. Well, you know, if, if you're captain of a ship, you're you're basically responsible for everyone's lives on there. And, and you know, the Bering Sea isn't exactly the most hospitable environment. Uh, for s- sailing, let alone anything else. Listen, I noticed that. I did notice that. <laughs> I, I, I chose not to. Well, yeah. I, I, chose, I chose special forces instead. I, I was good with that. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here like, I'm, I'm just like a graphic designer guy. Like, <laughs> That's okay. all good. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, so like, okay, for anybody who, who may be new to the show, and I know... A lot of people are like, wow, Chris, you're back. I'm like, yes. And they're like, well, you know, your old episodes are down. I'm like, yes, because we're, we're starting fresh. So like, help me out here and or help us all out here and jogs people's memory, or at least introduce people to, uh, you know, John Cadman and how you got into this whole, uh, subterranean chamber water Absolutely. pump building thing. Absolutely. Um, now the subterranean, here's kind of how it all came to be was back in 1999 there was a you know there was all the doomsday y2k stuff that was out and i was bored and trolling through some some alternate history books and i came across this one a doomsday book by uh, richard noon it's called five five two thousand and it was actually a really good book it's just he he had thrown that that five five two thousand Lip in it for sales, um, but it had to do mainly with the Templars and and ancient history and and things like uh, the Great Pyramid. A lot on the Great Pyramid and the pyramids, and a lot, uh, covered a lot of, like Tompkins, Peter Tompkins books uh, about the Great Pyramid and secrets of the Great Pyramid. But in there, in his book, in Richard Newton's book, he had a small section on. Uh, an author named uh, Edward Kunkel. And Edward Kunkel was, he was a hydraulic engineer back in the Depression era, so in the 20s and 30s. But he he had placed a bet about whether he could figure out how the Great Pyramid was built. And he had surmised, and Edward Kunkel had surmised that they'd used water locks to basically float the blocks up a you know a causeway to to place them where they needed to be. So he his his he had the original water lock theory and then he had kind of reverse engineered part of this subterranean chamber and then the whole upper pyramid assembly. And some of what he said made sense and some of it was you could tell he's wrong. And he never made a model that actually ran. But his book, the book was called The Pharaoh's Pump. 
uh, he, Edward Kunkel did the best he could for the resources he had. You know, he didn't have internet and things like that. It was, it was, a, it was harder to do research. So I actually, Edward Kunkel had described two different pumps. He described one that he just kind of glossed over, which basically just took in the uh, subterranean chamber, which is 100 feet below the base of the Great Pyramid itself, in, into the bedrock. And uh, he had called it the uh, construction pump. So that's what Edward Kunkel called it. And he, he didn't have, he had a lot of missing parts and he just kind of guessed about it. And he really glossed over it in just a few sentences about this construction pump, which was basically a, a modified hydraulic ram pump. And hydraulic ram pumps have been around forever, about the 1700s, they were invented in France. A uh, very simple water pump that uses part of the flowing water and stopping instantaneously to create uh, shock waves and high pressure spikes and, and salvaging the high pressure spikes through a through check valves. Basic, real basic, simple machine. Those have been around for ages and they were used in the, like the uh, American Midwest for the, at the farms and in the 1800s and into the 1900s, pretty common before electricity. And in 1999, I moved up to a, some property which had no electricity. It had a pond that was uphill, but it was probably about 600 feet away from where water needed to be mm -hmm. uh, on gardening and stuff. And so you need to move water. So necessity is the mother of all invention. And so I saw this pump, and it seemed like a, a very high efficiency hydraulic ramp pump utilizing some sort of vortex to, to boost the pumping ability. That, that was his uncle's theory. And, uh, back in June of 1999, I, I made what he described as the construction pump as supposed to be upper pyramid assembly. And it didn't work. And I put like months into it, <laughs> months into this model. And I was, I was, Claiming to all the friends and family, oh, this is the best thing. This will be the best thing ever. And yeah, I was kind of a, it was a laughing stock for a while, but I knew he, I didn't know Kunkel had a bunch right. And so between June of 1999 and, and December 31st of 1999, the very last day of uh, the millennium, um, I, I did a bunch of research and it actually came to me the solution in uh, yeah, December 31st, 1999, the evening of all things, last hours of the millennium. And I sketched out and uh, changed a bunch of different lines around so it matched the top of, top, topography of the Giza Plateau mm -hmm. and all the evidence. And uh, and built it, and on April 3rd of 2000, first try, the thing ran. Like, it was, I was happy. <laughs> now, yeah. Well, yeah. in the, the unit that you have there, that's, like, is that from the, like, from the mount? If I'm not mistaken, that was actually the first, one of the first models that you had developed. Is that correct? The the one that's right next to you that's lit up in a very nice eerie blue color. It's it's this is the next generation. Oh, this is going to be one. It's almost finished, and it's going to be uh, the first inkjet model. It has twenty seven inkjet ports that you can individually put ink into with it running, with the water running in through it and pulsing. And the pulsing part was really the key because uh, uh, I couldn't do uh, any other models before built something that was absolutely bulletproof. And this, this is literally bulletproof. The top is an inch and a half thick acrylic. It's going to have like 10 head bolts around it. 
Uh, so it's actually bolted into place, almost done. It'll be done within a week. And then to be able to actually run the model, inject ink into different ports, um, different colors, any color you want, and film it in slow mono or whatever you want. It's in a controlled environment. It's going to be inside, um, temperature and humidity controlled, so it's camera friendly. Uh, and the glass doesn't steam up, fog up. Like, I had that problem with other ones. Now, it, it, taking a few steps, like, well, first of all, it, you know, for, for anybody to build this, I'm going to say, like, literally in your backyard, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a feat in itself just from, you know, from, from home engineering. Uh, and why, <laughs> I should say, why do you think they built this in the first place? Like, did they, it, it obviously was for a purpose and not, you know, it's like, Hey, let's make something that's, that's a, a hydraulic ram pump, you know, without, without an ending. Uh, it, like what, what do you think the, the, I'd say the goal was for the Egyptians if this was, if like, if they built it for that purpose. I, I don't think it was made for pumping water. It, it does that really well. It's extremely efficient. It's better than any hydraulic ram pump built by a, a huge factor and it's, it's also more flexible. It's, and, and I've run, this is model number four. But I've put millions of cycles to that, and it always runs. It's the best machine I've ever built. The most, it always runs. Uh, can't say that with a lot of machines. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, I, I know that the design's right, but I, and I've used it to pump water. It's a great water pump, but really what it was made for is what really what Chris Dunn had said. And he wrote it, he wrote in his book, uh, The Giza Flower Plant, which was published back in 1998. He had a very short blip in there about the subterranean chamber. And what he said was that the subterranean chamber housed the equipment, which sent a vertical pulse up into the pyramid's core towards the to King's Chamber and Queen's Chamber, but it it caused the initial pulses to start the Great Pyramid to resonate. So that was what Chris Dunn had wrote. And when I first ran this and heard it and saw how everything was, uh, how it had directed the, the pulse wave directly vertical and the aggressiveness of the pulse, um, I knew Chris was right immediately and I wrote him a couple days. <laughs> Chris, you're right. <laughs> it is a pulse. It's a pulse generator. I, I said, it's a giant subwoofer underneath the Great Pyramid. And, like, and then later I, later that year, I make, put a better terminology to it, which is hydraulics. It's water fluid. It's a pulse generator. So actually they made it to create an extreme, we're talking really extreme pulse that shoots directly up into the core of the Great Pyramid, straight, straight towards the uh, uh, the Queen's Chamber, King's Chamber. And the King's Chamber itself, I think it's more for the King's Chamber. And it's it's a freestanding, it's, it's, the King's Chamber is made of rose quartz granite. It's freestanding from the walls and the floor. And it has, a, well, it has like a, some sort of texture or something. So it's, it, it, it re is made to resonate. So, and I know these chamber grand galleries made to resonate as, and like you know that that falls on to, uh, you know, Doug Keenan's work. Uh, I know that you yeah. that he you you guys have talked multiple times. We've I've had him on yeah. the show way way back when multiple times, and it's it's interesting to be able to see the uh, the ideas going back and forth with you know like okay well. It's resonating well if one's resonating you know the other pyramids is the receiver that you know ideas about being able to image the solar system that that type you know trying to use it for like astro astronomy or uh, uh radio astronomy or something similar to that you know these these ideas are are uh just I'm gonna say that they're to some people they'll be they would be out there to others it would be you know groundbreaking um 
you know, depending on which side of the fence you're on. I, I just think it's cool <laughs> one way or another. Uh, now, when, when you're looking at the, the pyramid itself, uh, you, you, like you go into work, let's say of uh, like Robert Bavall, who will say, uh, you know, it, if it wasn't necessarily a machine for that, or, you know, uh, the, he'll say that, um, or has said that there's no way that it could have held water because of the, the construction. It would have leaked, uh, leaked like a sieve. And you know, that that's echoed through whether you're dealing with mainstream archeology span or, and, and I actually, I'm pretty sure he had mentioned that to me on, on, on an earlier show back in, 2017 i believe so you know is that something that you have looked at or uh, has been brought to your attention to say like well it couldn't have held water because you know it's not airtight or it's not watertight and it would have just been bursting out of the seams all over the place uh like how how have you approached that kind of argument well with that argument i my my setup doesn't even put water into the upper part of the great pyramid so <clears throat> does it's it, it doesn't matter if it leaks or not because it's not filling it up well Maybe. i I, th I think that's mostly for uh you know some theories not necessarily with yours directly but some I theories have had theories, yeah. yeah like they they'll have it directly within the chambers and the chambers will be moving water back and forth and yeah. you know where you're where you're dealing directly with the subterranean chamber itself yeah so, Yes, it's completely different. It's see that's that's the that's where the uh, a lot of the the confusion is is it comes originally from Edward Conkle. Edward Conkle had proposed initially that it was a construction um, underneath the Great Pyramid, which had the subterranean chamber, and he thought that provided initial water to just move the blocks, and then. The second part of his theory, which he really expanded upon, is most of his stuff. And there's a fellow in Coos Bay, Oregon, who's just plagiarizing Conkle's work and is wrong about it all. He does stupid songs, but uh, on YouTube. But he, uh, um, but that they they are saying that the pyramid itself used. A vacuum system by using some fire up in the grand gallery area. And when you create a fire, the fire creates a vacuum and it sucks water up. And, and then they figured it did a double like, suction up to from the queen's chamber up to the king's chamber. And then it was shot out of the, the shafts that go up and towards the top, the upper part of the pyramid and then figured yeah, irrigation. Yeah, yeah, please, please don't, irrigation be, don't, 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 be, don't, don't be mentioning shooting out of any shafts here. This is a family show. <laughs> like... <laughs> so, but it was like, and then went through, this was from Conkle and then Dickheads. Uh, and, and, anyways, the, the guy in Coos Bay, he, uh, he, he, they, they're saying it's made for irrigation. And I'm telling you, it's not a pump. It's not made for irrigation. If the water's all down in the uh, below the bedrock. It's below the bedrock. It's not going to leak, and if it does leak, it doesn't matter. Even if it's porous limestone, it doesn't matter. It's it it you be saturated, water saturated with a bit of oozing through the through the limestone. That's not a problem. Now, how it's, how did the water get into the pyramid? Like the the pyramid yeah. itself. Like obviously, it's it, there. There's a difference between um your model in you know uh, on your property that you've built which is specifically um uh, around a perfect scenario of water uh, a water delivery system uh, have you taken into account what the nile would have looked like at that point uh, in terms of its its banks and and you know obviously the nile river has shifted uh its course over uh, over the millennia uh, like how how would they have gotten the water or use the water then for that use in that chamber at that point is that is like can you explain that process yes upstream upstream in the nile uh it's probably a, i don't know exactly how many miles but they had they actually had a dam up there and a channel system that went to went to the uh Fayum oasis which is called now 
to uh, a depression below sea level, large depression, but it used to be uh, Lake Morris. So they actually had a big lake the size of Lake Erie that was uphill and upstream from the Nile. It, and it's still, it's obvious on Google Earth and it, it, it's in history books, but it was Lake Morris. And then there was, there's tunnels absolutely everywhere in all the Giza Plateau. And there used to be a tunnel they called it a charm or a well that was in front of the, basically in front of the door area of the uh, Great Pyramid itself. And it was uh, described by, I think Petri was that other guy. Uh, it, it, was, it was documented and it's since departed, but it went down 42 feet and then it's got filled with sand and then somehow it got, it, it left. But, the one thing, so it was just a gravity feed from the Lake Morris down a tunnel system, which is everywhere around there. And, and it just gravity fed to the moat area around the Great Pyramid. So they, all, the, all the pyramids had uh, walled, in, walled enclosures, all of them did. And that's not even controversial, like a moat system and an overflow. Now, like the, the subterranean chamber. Uh, seems to have been quarried uh, around the start of the construction of the pyramid or possibly even well before that. Uh, is, is it possible that they could have st like been using something very similar to this prior to the construction? Or, you know, is there evidence that, you know, this is something that was recent or they made modifications to it? It was, it does appear that it was, it was from before the pyramid itself was built. Uh, there was a test shaft in that general area where they, they did a couple of different things different. Uh, Chris Dunn talks about it. And he just said it was like a test, test, uh, sorry, he called something different. So it, it was made before the pyramid itself and it doesn't need the pyramid there at all. So you could actually take the pyramid off and the, the whole sub-assembly still runs. It's it's just, the pyramid itself is just a, a machine that's sitting on, on top of it. And it probably wouldn't make much sense to do that. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're blasting your tunes with the, you know, your your, your back door open, all, all, the, all the bass is going out. And it's like, you'll annoy the neighbors, but you're not going to do much good with it. <laughs> Now, now you, when, when you started building this, like it's obviously it's very difficult for you to be able to match your measurements for your model, uh, you know, tool turn for tool turn against the, the real subterranean chamber. Like how, how did you model the, uh, the measurements? The measurements, I, I came to use a scale of a quarter inch to the foot. It worked out really well for the shafts because they're four, basically four foot, three foot, and two foot shafts. So you go, you know, four fours is one inch, and to be able to do square shafts, one inch, three quarter inch, half inch, and uh, so I just use the one to forty eight scale. It made it well, it made it this size for the sub chamber. So like eleven inches by seven inches. And or, like the room, which is 27 feet by 46 feet by 13 foot high. So this, like this room, when you walk around and walk up on the steps and stuff, it's it's a big room. It's the biggest room in the pyramid itself or under it. No, to, to some people, they'll say, okay, that's cool. Oh, okay, no, he's got a flashlight. I thought there was like, oh, we've got a light in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got a flashlight. <laughs> That works. That works. Somebody's got to do it. It's like we're, we're going to turn this machine on and we're going to ascend, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, there, there, are al there are always going to be people um, who will, who are, who are going to criticize or say that the idea is crazy. Um, the fact that it's again, like the fact that it's working, is is a testament in itself. You're, you are going to have individuals who are going to say that, well, it's not an exact replica or modifications to the measurements were made based on 
you know, the needs to actually get it working in a model versus versus real life. Uh, you know, now, w when you're talking about you've like copied the measurements almost exactly, uh, like are there any differences from, you know, you know, like from the original construction to what you have, uh, what you've constructed? Yeah, I did. I did do a little bit of modification, and it it had to do with the descending passage. I used a round inch and a quarter pipe instead of making the full thing um, one inch square on the on the interior. I didn't see I didn't see a big difference in the flow for the two long pipes on. I think all the interior section, the square pipes are critical. And so I made all the square shafts. Everything as close to accurate as possible within it's probably 95 percent accurate and how are you accounting for the water flow pressure the water flow pressure it's there's a, there's two pressures there's the well there's the just the gravitational pressure you know, that the, the head pressure which and it's a oh in the in the great pyramid itself it's 100 feet plus uh 30 foot uh on this model it's probably seven feet plus 15, seven feet uh which is seven feet times it's 0.2 is it 0.28 pounds per foot it, so it's not that many much pressure on the model until you actually run it and the and running it involves a a valve which uh stops instant instantly water flow causes the valve to shut and when water closes the valve instantaneously since it's basically it's nearly incompressible waters so it does a water hammer which causes a, a giant shock wave like old pipes in old houses you turn off a faucet somewhere in the pipes go bang 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 but that's the same thing it's a water hammer and it, uh, yeah that'll usually happen with metal pipes uh like even here up in canada I, I, we haven't really used metal um f i think since like the 50s or 60s mostly it's, it's it's been pvc since the late 70s on so getting the water hammer uh effect is is a little hard in most houses um it's, they have water hammer arresters too, and I'll put, put in the houses. It's just a little air gap. It's a little copper tube that goes up. It has an air gap, and then to, plumbers should put it on a pipe so at a point. It's, the air air kills water hammer. Oh, yeah. So you, ma major difference in pressure. Air is a lot more compressible. Water, yes. as you said, is not. So. <laughs> well, and, but on this model, even this model, the, just by having the, the the water hammer and the and the static pressure just the if it's not moving the water pressure in the pipes is like three psi three pounds per stretch which is very low and then when you as soon as you hit the uh throw the waste state valve on and it's it's doing the water hammer effect it's no less than 150 psi at the valve but really i'm thinking it's when you get into instantaneous or near instantaneous spikes it's got to be over 450 psi so you got a a, a, a a scaling factor let's say three versus 450 like 150 factor just by doing introducing the water hammer i know it's that much because it breaks the p uh, the pvc uh uh connections as i recall you've discovered that a few times a few times a few <laughs> different pvc materials i use schedule 80 i've used um the white regular pvc and i've used uh it's like the conduit which is a little more flexible and i broke them all so i i know it's a good spike pressure you know, plus i've measured with a with the gauge with gauges i've measured 100 i've seen 150 psi at, at the waste state and then the pump, if you use it as a pump itself, it'll pump at 
I put out 45 PSI from three. So it's a, a factor of 15 just from the head pressure, just from the grav gravity of uh, the water above the subchamber itself. I find it interesting that, you know, for for the Egyptians to have constructed a, uh, you know, th this this type of like basically a partless machine, and it's it's the only one of its kind that's been seen, at least that I can recall off the top of my head. Like while you were doing your research and building this, like have you run across any other potential, uh, you know, like potential either copies or other instances of this either in another pyramid or in another building or even another cave um not necessarily to this design but you know with with a similar idea or function no no it's it's unique that i've i've never seen this anywhere i've never seen even hydraulic ramp pumps that utilize the the pressure spike as a as its main function like to cause a, a a resonance as opposed to as as opposed to trying to uh just pump water you know the pumping water on this thing is, that's just a real byproduct it, it's not even necessary in fact i normally run it with the not pumping water yep. that generally alleviates this one argument that the dead end shaft never had an opening at the end and so Oh, it's wrong because there wasn't opening at the end. Well, I I run it normally with the dead end, dead end. It's just a hydraulic pulse generator. I'm trying to recall who would have said that. <laughs> it's, it's, I, 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 I know, I know. There, there was my goodness. Who was it? Like Denver and I were were talking about this the last the last show, and you know, bless his heart, love him to death, and he's always good for a laugh in that regard. Uh, yeah, no, it, and so it, it's anybody who doesn't know, we're, we're not going to mention his name because, well, I don't. He want doesn't to. deserve it. Well, that, that, that too. He has been on the show before and then, you know, it's, it, he, let, let's just say as after that, he was, uh, hours and hours of entertainment <laughs> over that. <laughs> <clears throat> He'll come yeah. in and talk and it's like, well, would have gotten into an argument. I'm like, I wonder what John Cadman has to say about this. <laughs> Tag John. Yeah. She'll come in. I'm like, oh, my I'm not, God. he's not. He's not a friend of mine. No, I know and that. Well, that was that was the intent was just to be able to. Uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, annoy and aggravate him. It's like if he's going to troll, I'm going to troll back back just as hard. And I know you love that stuff. Thank so, you. Uh, so, and uh, obviously, you know, I'm at the age now where I can't. I don't have the time or the energy or or the uh, uh, awake hours. <laughs> oh. I can put into that anymore. But it's good to reminisce on the good old days. Um, yeah. Uh, now, when when you're looking at at this machine, and obviously you know not accounting for um, you know any potential uh, lessons that may have been learned from certain individuals who should not be named failures, uh, like what other things that have you discovered with during the last twenty three years now of developing this that you know kind of surprised you? There's a bunch of things that really surprised me. Um, the pressures. Blew me away. Uh, just, it took so much to actually get a model so it wouldn't self-destruct. Uh, just this model itself, small model, you know, not a lot of head pressure on it. Um, but if you just do simple calculations, just the surface area, if you had like seven inches by 11 inches, that's 77 square inches on the surface on the top. And, and if you, run a spike of, let's, let's say on the low side, let's say 40 PSI. I know that's very low on this, but 40 PSI times 70, that's a, that's a 2,800. And I'm thinking like in terms of PSI, the last... it's like, it's like a ton, it, it'll, it puts out a ton of pressure upwards from this small area. And that's just from this model. And I find that crazy because like even like if, if you think about pressures, most people, when they think pressure, they think tire pressure and, you know, the average tire, depending on the size, the make or the model, could be anywhere from about 28 to, you know, 35 PSI. And if you, you, put, you pop a, a car tire, all you, know, you just hear that bang. And that's that's a tremendous amount of force. And that's just coming, that's just air that's been that's been pressurized in there. If you're talking that, that much pressure with water, you know, if, if anything were to go wrong, 
heaven forbid, especially with... Oh, it, break. it breaks things. It breaks things, yes. Well, it, like, how, how many pipes did you go... <laughs> how many pipes did you go through in, in, like, even just the last year alone? Like, have you... Like, have you, have you ruled out different types of fasteners or like, oh, you can't use the screw-ons or you can't use glue? Um, yeah, I, I eliminate a lot of things. I, I Right now, I'm just running, I use a, the conduit PVC and I use the heavier stuff. So it's a Schedule 80. It's glued together. The stuff, that you could run you know, tractors over it. It's really durable. And then it also doesn't have any threads and and. I had problems with having, uh, I, I used steel pipe at one point, uh, Schedule A steel pipe. But then at the unions, you've got a, a little upward air area where you'd get air in it. And then air kills hydro water handles. So you, you know, that wasn't really good. So steel wasn't good. Um, and uh, the main thing is just serious overkill on the builds. If I'm using an inch and a half thick acrylic top, and the thing's heavy, but it, it'll be great for filming. You can see through it, but it, it weighs like 30 pounds. Just the acrylic top that goes on this model. It's it's and it's gonna have 10 head bolts on it, and <clears throat> just so it doesn't flex and break. And but I had I've had I've broken tons of both one uh, concrete model. Uh, first, the very first light pulse I did on it, 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 it broke the concrete and I still have that one kicking around. Like, yeah, it broke one pulse. It was a light pulse. It was the lightest pulse I could do. Oh, concrete. Like if it's not reinforced concrete, it's, yeah. it's a crapshoot. Um, like ha have you considered transparent aluminum? No. <laughs> <laughs> for, any, uh, for anybody I, who's I, under I, the I, age I, of like 30 it's it's a star trek you know it's a huh. star trek four joke i mean it'd be really yeah. cool i mean i'd love to do it in other materials but this is what i'm using right now um it's gonna be epoxy and uh but it's it's gonna be so thick i mean the epoxy is gonna be yay thick and i've got all these uh individual Inkjet tubes. Uh, they're actually from inkjet printer. They come like like uh, uh, fan. Uh, they come in uh, eight strands wide. So I'll have all the inkjet out through the molding. Maybe I'll inject ink into it. But it's just really overkill on the build, so that it won't break. And that's that's as a it's a ridiculous overkill at that point for such a, a small assembly. How, how are you sourcing the acrylic? Like, are, do, you, do you have like a local acrylic guy who, you know, like, like, hey man, I, I broke through another one. Can you get me another slab? And he's just like, oh, I, like that, are you putting somebody's I, I, kid through college with this? I I I, I went and I did the internet and I was just looking for, um, I was looking for Lexan, but I I talked to a fellow, a young guy down in, I think it was Long Beach, California, and but it was a it was a that's their specialty, plastics. Uh, Industrial Plastics Incorporated, I think what it's called. And so I told them what I was building. And I said, yeah, I need it I need it super strong. And it has to be very clear. He's going to be doing filming through it. And so he actually, he's, he hooked me up. He said, use this. You know, I paid him, of course. And it's like, I think it was like 300 bucks for a piece. But... <clears throat> It, it made it and it's going to work. And, and then, and then the epoxy I bought, like in, in the two part epoxy, the four, I bought, I bought two, four, I bought oh eight goodness. gallons for the pour. I just like, I was just going to get all the same one. And I got it from the, the epoxy store in Michigan or somewhere. And so they sent me the eight gallons of the two parts. So I have enough to do the, the pour. Uh, plus, and but that's how what we used to make the whole model. Whole model is just small pores of of the two part clear epoxy. They would just do, and I had a silicone mold from that pretty much used to for the form that I put together years ago. 
you know, so, with, so with with so. the actual uh, like subterranean chamber part, ha- have you run into issues with that breaking? Not once I built it strong enough. I just overkill built. I, no problems. No problems at all. It's mostly like just the like first, the water flow. The first one's broke. The first one's broke. I mean, they they just expanded and cracked and <laughs> did everything wrong. <laughs> They were made out of epoxy and fiberglass. I mean, they're pretty thick. And they just expanded. <laughs> oh, it needs to be in reinforced concrete or something. So the first one that I actually made work back in 2000 was I, I, I put it in, in a plastic recycled bins, but containers and poured concrete and rock and rebar. And, I put all sorts of steel chunks in there and poured it. And it's like, I hope it works because this isn't ever coming apart. And it, it never did break. Um, made some mistakes on it. And also I was, I regretted putting any sort of ferrous material in it. And so I don't have ferrous material. So any, any uh, steel or iron. Um, if it breaks it, all of a sudden you've got ballistic material shooting up in either direction. Uh, the main the main reason I, I was looking is the pyramid itself seems to be some sort of magnetic machine um, from a whole bunch of people's research. Everybody from like the the Golods, Anatoly Golod in Moscow, his his giant pyramid structure. It's 144 foot. The one they did all the uh, shape experimentation out, outside Moscow. That's brilliant work. Uh, but it has to be, it's a magnetic machine. And uh, Patrick Flanagan, the uh, originator of uh, it's a pyramid power, it's, it's got to be aligned to north, south. And it's a magnetic machine. It does stuff. And so if you have a magnetic machine, you don't want to, you know, steal in it anywhere to do whatever it would do. I know. So I just made sure I used non ferrous materials. Now, like if, if you used ferrous materials, uh, like what it just wouldn't work, or it just wouldn't have the same, like the spirit of the machine, like not spirit, I mean metaphorical, you know, <laughs> spirit of the word, you know, like the, the the spirit of a law versus the word of a law. Like, is it is it more of like just a tradition thing, or is there something that is wouldn't work or would happen if it were ferrous? You know, I I just don't know, and I just try to is consistent with the, the original building if, so I, I i just made sure there was no ferrous materials you know use brass or copper you could use brass head bolts for the bolt the, the head down so they're it's 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 just attention to detail so did attention to detail on everything <clears throat> in the room all the all the fins because there's hydraulic fins in there and the, all these weird pieces and or weird, weird structure within the, the section itself just attention to detail now everyone uh, everyone asks you know what are the pyramids but nobody ever asks why are the pyramids so i'm going to ask at least in terms of the driving need to build this you know i'll do my best peter griffin philosopher impression why <laughs> What what, dro- what drove you to say, you know what? Damn it! I'm I'm going to build this thing. Like I, I understand the interest. I understand the need to say, okay, well it works, but you know, is, is there anything deeper to that? It's calling. Why? Oh, it's a calling. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Called my name and it's possessed me. Uh, um. <clears throat> Well, you build it, they'll come. Yeah, if, if I build it, they'll come. You know, build the <laughs> dreams. Uh, well, the original one, with the as as each build comes along, I'm I tend to test more aspects of it. Um, the first one just showed that it was a pump, and it was a messy model, and it had, had a lot of errors and stuff in it. And, but then the second one, it was 16 years later, and, and Chris Dunn was coming, and 
and I discovered a, a glacial boulder sitting on the property that was split. That would be there. All right, I remember that. Right, it just happened to be the right size to put a model in it like, and oh. fill it with concrete and put build this hydraulic pulse generator generator in the in the middle of a hydro of a, a glacial boulder that's sitting on bedrock because it is it was split by the glacier when it was here and it was kind of meant to be and that one worked it worked brilliantly it worked it still works it worked brilliantly it works brilliantly and that one had done a bunch of setup to be able to do um audio recordings directly above the subchamber itself through the concrete so i could actually get the record the what frequencies this was putting out plus the amplitude you know how loud is it is it is it just a little pissy little beep you know or is it or is it something substantial what's the frequency range and that was that itself is like you know a huge challenge as far as as far as um i had help uh, by robert Vauter, who's a sound engineer down in monterey and it's, he's he's as he's as educated and fluid about all the ancient egypt stuff as chris Dunn, so it says a lot Dunn's probably knows more than anybody that i know of and Vauter's the same but, but he I, I was just gonna say, so he he helped me as far as getting the lower frequencies because I wanted to cut, record down to, well, uh, human hearing cuts off at fifty hertz, uh, and so microphones generally just naturally drop the range below that for the most part, unless you get better microphones. So he told me which microphone to get to get down to five hertz. So I wanted to get below seven hertz, which is the Earth's frequency, human resonance. I want to get below human resonance because I want to see if if it's in that range and what sort of amplitude. Um, and I want the full range all the way up. I want accurate recordings of, of amplitude of, without noise and and guaranteed accuracy. So he hooked me up with a, uh, I think it's a Umic microphone. Uh, very accurate down to five hertz. And then he told me how to isolate it to get accurate recordings. And then he also helped me with the program to do the, so here's the program you use because it's, it's, well, it's free, but it's also, it goes down to five hertz and most audio or sound uh, analysis programs don't go down to five hertz and it does. And then he helped do the analysis and what we found was it's it's extremely aggressive on the lower range frequencies. Uh, so it in, in the okay, in the boulder build, in the boulder, it's like 15 feet across or something. It's a big boulder. Yeah. And, yeah, it's like five meters across. And, and uh and the recordings from it, the isolated recordings, I recorded it running, and I'm just using PVC pipe. Uh, and and the check valve is not it's not what would be a Giza. Giza would be the, 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 the valve itself would be granite and it'd be in a basalt sort of like sleeve and be four foot wide and sliding and water and I mean the, the the aggression of that would be absolutely monumental. It'd be extremely aggressive, extremely loud. Um, and it worked. But even with that small, I, I used the plunger, the, the sliding plunger with the O-ring and, and it's through a plastic pipe, but it's it, it's you know stabilized at the end so the pipe doesn't flex too much. But even that, the recordings from just the water and the shockwave running up this plastic pipe and then being reflected and an elbow and going up into the, the subchamber itself and then up through the concrete. So it's being transferred from the water through the concrete 
went up to where the microphone is that's isolated and freestanding. Um, that was louder than taking a sledgehammer and, and slamming the, the boulder right next to where that microphone was. So it's, it's more aggressive. Just this water hammer, water spike going to the, the water pipe and <clears throat> collected and going and transferred through rock. It's more aggressive than a, a, you know, a six <clears throat> pound mall being slammed against the boulder right in the vicinity of where that microphone is. That's, 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 that's it's not subtle. It's very aggressive. If they had this this like giant, you know, granite valve, yes, in the pyramid itself, like how how did they get it in there? <laughs> to I'm gonna like did, did they excavate, put it in, and then cover back up, or did they cut it directly out of the the bedrock? It's kind of like you, you've got the right ideas. It's actually in front of the, down by the Sphinx, and this the Nile used to be right at the Sphinx. It was at the Pali, just in front of. There's a temple in front of the Sphinx Paws, and not used to be right there. So it's only 2,000 feet away. That's not far. But the valve would have been closer to where the Sphinx is. Uh, it's a four foot square pipe. And it would have, they would have just actually, the best design from an engineering stat, standpoint would just be to be tunneled straight down uh, where, where, you know, you've got a shaft that comes down. Just, Tunnel down, you've got bedrock before and after. You've got bedrock after, and just put in some like uh, uh, some sleeves, like in, in cars it'd be like valve sleeves or, or, or a piston sleeve. Okay. So, so you got a piston, you got sleeves, you got iron sleeve around the piston, so that you wear. Well, this would just use granite sleeves cut down into the limestone bedrock. In a base, and then they, all they'd have to do is put a top down, top of it, and you know, some rocks. They're, they're very smart people, and so if all all the shock wave is actually being, and you'd have to have a valve seat, so it's like, so it wouldn't wear. You wouldn't want to grant it against limestone. That'd be terrible. Yeah, that, that, yeah, no, like yeah, lim that, limestone's gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it so you'd have a. You know, you have granite against granite. That that's fine. Um, but then you have the whole limestone bedrock way beyond it. That's going to handle the, the shock wave. No wear and tear. And and if you have to do maintenance, uh, change the valve or which is just a little sliding granite box, like kind of like a sarcophagus. Um, you just take the, you know, pull up the top, you know, place the, the sleeves and, and the base and or the valve seat and drop a new assembly in there and, you know, go back up and run again. It's, it's, it's made for maintenance. No, It'd be really like you, you've had like Chris, Chris Dunn seen it. You've had, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm going to say the entire world yeah. has seen it because yeah. you, you have been on, uh, ancient aliens uh, a few times. So, yeah. so if, if you're looking at, I'm, I'm going to say mainstream archaeo, like in terms of Egyptologists or archaeologists, what has their reaction been over the last couple of years as this has been getting out there? Because I understand for, you know, for some individuals in the, the, in academia, anything, if it's, if it's on ancient aliens, it's basically considered entertainment, but you're dealing with actual proved built engineering so it's not just a supposition this is like hey this is a model it's working <laughs> you know ex explain this uh like what what has what their reaction been to that silence <laughs> disregard i don't know i don't get anything it's it's strange it's really strange it's just silence because it's been published it's been in it's been publishing uh in uh, Dr. John DeSalvo's book, uh, The Complete Pyramid Source Book, I had a chapter in that um, back in 2003. And he's he's a mainstream author. He was a biophysicist uh, uh, 
professor at John Hopkins University. And he's tiny. That's he's an educated guy. And he's, he also has a lot of other books. And he's the director of the Great Pyramid of Geese Search Research Association, which I'm part of. And I've got some articles on there. And as does Joe Parr and the Russian, the Anatoly Bolod. And the Russian research is all there. Uh, for the shape effects, which are phenomenal. Um, no, I just don't get anything. It's really strange. And I, I've, I've reached out. Here's how strange it is. I, I, the town I live in, I live in Bellingham, Washington. And it's, it's you know, a, a growing town. But there's always a kind of a college mill town up by a Canadian border up by Vancouver. Really, it's like 20 miles from Vancouver <laughs> to the border. Uh, we're... we're <laughs> We're it's a Canadian so, suburb, okay? It, it's so yeah. close you can smell the high mortgage rates. Uh, I, I see, see, yeah, that's they, they live here and they shop here because it's half the price for like Tijuana for for Vancouver. <laughs> you know, we're cheaper here, but it's not anymore. But it was. Yeah, uh, we, we we were running into the same thing uh, with uh, crap. I can't even remember it now. Uh, it, the, the, you know, the, there, there's a, a an American town across the border, very close. Like you just head down the 416. Town. Yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 like people will take their pets there because the the uh, the vet veterinarians aren't anywhere near as expensive as they are in Ottawa. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I go to the next county down for my vet yeah. veterinarian because the Canadians come here and it's it's, it's targeted for the Canadians and it's really expensive. In this county, and I so I drive 20, mi 20 miles south to my bet there. See, I, I gotta look this up now because this, this is gonna town. Go Ottawa. City of Ottawa maps. Like, we're pretty close to the board. Like, uh, where I live is about halfway between the city limits and uh, Ogdenburg. Ogdenburg, New York. So it's it's about halfway between, um, or twice the dis difference, but twice the different, twice the distance, um, which probably would be going by this. Uh, search Adamson. No. Measure distance. Edmonton. Edmonton. Yeah, Edmonton. Distance to here. Yeah, it's, no. <clears throat> Let's say it's about fifty clicks, maybe Edmonton. sixty. So we're we're about like I live about sixty clicks from the from the American border and okay the, the amount so, of people although although like you're you're talking east versus west so you know upstate yeah. New York is much different than than uh, uh, you know Washington State um, kind of the same thing it's like people from Ottawa are nowhere are not the same as people from Vancouver completely different culture. oh my god yes east east and west very different very different in Canada especially Canada um, here too but not as not as distinct. I mean, in the states. Uh, is it close to Edmonton? Um, close? no, not even, not even close. Edmonton's upwards of about two thousand kilometers, twenty five hundred kilometers. Oh, okay, that's, wow. that's a ways. That's yeah, well, it, it, it's about two. Uh, if I would say between where I am to where you are, it's about three quarters of the way. Okay. So yeah, well, again, you're also talking about like the U.S. and Canada, it's continent apart. I'm also realizing like, oh, it's about eleven o'clock here. It's nine o'clock, eight o'clock where you are right now. Yeah, it's eight. Yeah. Yeah. It's Pacific. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> I deal with the Pacific East Coast time. Right? <clears throat> it's one of the reasons why I'm doing the later shows because we always had big, you know, big audiences out in in California and, and uh, you know up the West Coast go figure so it's like mm, if i get them after dinner time they'll probably be a little more appreciative than me saying like oh i'm just getting off work and then of lore's on like okay you know I, I i can stand it it's not really that big of a problem um but like you know if, if you're dealing with with i'm gonna say like this would normally be around the time where people are starting to sit down for dinner and obviously if you're doing your testing uh, and with the, with the machine on, or if you're doing recordings, or you're doing a demonstration, it's probably not going to be it around this time because you don't want to tick your neighbors off more than you probably already have building this thing. 
So uh, again, I also don't know how how large of a plot of land it could be. Several acres. It could be the size of a backyard. I don't know. I've never been there. Well, it's on a ten acre parcel. Okay, so and then there's like in in the lots on this. It's on top of a mountain, <clears throat> like Spocker Mountain. I, I guess it's a mountain. It's more like a hill. Um, and there's I, I don't know. I've got five acres. <laughs> the two of them are all <laughs> just, so it's like. John, there's a bear in the area. Turn the machine on. It's like, okay, we'll try and scare it off. The, you know, the bear is just there with, like, glow sticks just dancing next to him. Like, well, at least it's occupied. You know, I'm sorry, guys. I tried. Awesome. <laughs> uh, it, like, it, how, you've built the machine. You've gone through several iterations. The, the, the new model is there. Yes. What are you hoping to scale up like are you looking to scale up or, or do you have plans for this have you already marked out your pyramid uh foundations have you cleared off a plateau near a river that you're ready to get work on H help me out here and, and give me an idea of, of what the next step is the next step the next step is actually with the inkjet because i really want to do some uh, an analysis of okay going backwards a little bit i i have done the testing uh, with the ink jets back in 2002 and when Steve Mailer was out here and I had, you know, digital cameras weren't very good back then. And I just had glass and couldn't do any pulses because the slightest pulse would break the glass and did. Uh, but I was able to determine the flows. And what came out was it does a, a beautiful Fibonacci spiral vortex, a 3D one to boot. It does the most amazing, um, like almost a tornado type vortex. It's, it's gorgeous. And so what, and now, now this is before it's pulsing. And, and so with this inkjet, I'll be able to actually run, run it, have it pulsing. So you have shock waves going up and back and forth through it. Mm -hmm. And also have the water flow. And I really am interested in vortices with the extreme pressure or ex ex extreme pressure uh, shock wave that goes through this through the middle of the vortice we're starting to look at I'm, I'm, I'm watching a lot of things on uh, the epic tornadoes documentaries this is really almost parallel to let's say the or uh, the vortice of a tornado going through the pipe and this one goes down to the earth, but there's a extreme um, shock wave or a pressure that's going back and forth, independent from the flow. It's completely independent from the flow, the water flow. The shock wave doesn't even care about it. It's the, the velocity and everything. It, it's So that would be equivalent to say uh, a lightning strikes in tornadoes. They're, it's completely independent, but they are related. You know, the lightning strike doesn't care if it's if there's spinning wind and stuff like that or debris. It just sees a differential in, in electric electrical differential between in the ionosphere down to the ground. This is very similar to that. And, and again, just a, a shout out to Taps here for the twenty dollars super chat. He says that my friend is back, and obviously he means uh, John because I'm everyone's friend. So. I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much for the support. Um, now, have you had it struck by lightning while it's running? Like, is this is this a worry or a concern? No, no, no not, not only that. There's not a lot. We don't have a lot of lightning here. It's it's very rare, like a few times a year. It's not like East Coast, which or the plains. You don't have lightning doesn't really have much, but. It, uh, to, Toronto had lightning, thunder, snowstorm. I I heard about that in Connecticut because my woman's in Connecticut, and so she's Get like, through, yeah, yeah, there's the the snow, lightning, and thunder. I said, what? what the hell are you talking about? I don't even know what that is. It basically it's just a, it's a thunder like it's a thunderstorm, oh. it, lake effect with Lake Ontario. Usually, you've got a lot of humid, warm air. Um, that that kind of permeates um, the air around the Niagara region and, and Niagara on the Lake region okay. so, south so of there. Right by, uh, you're right by Danny Kerr. 
Um, no, I'm, I'm probably about a seven hour drive northeast. Oh, okay. Of okay. Uh, haven't had the chance. I keep saying like, oh man, we should like hang out, and I'm like, I haven't been down to the. He's Niagara so area. cool too. Yeah, no, he's yeah. been in the chat. He keeps. Uh, he keeps messaging, and I, I'll, I'll like glance at it because I've got the laptop in front of me, and then I hear it. It's something funny, and I'm like, "Did Danny say that?" Funny. And it's like just message redacted. I'm like, S-, "Like, oh man." <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, his work on uh, Tesla pyramids. Yes, he's, he's got a lot of really. He has fascinating work. I don't see. I don't really understand all the the upper pyramid assembly works and theories so much because it doesn't really hit home to me. And that's nothing against anybody's works. Um, I just, it's just, I don't understand it. It wasn't the piece of puzzle that was given to me. I understand the subchamber. That was kind of given to me. And so I just try to do it, the subchamber, as accurately as possible. So other people can, you know, confidently base their part of the pyramid works and incorporate mine as, as part of the that machine. So they can they have confidence in my work being not sketchy. Now it, it's reproduced accurate. Well it's it's funny because like Danny's in chat, I like you know, Doug's in chat. Like basically whenever we're having on the show, Danny and Doug come out of the woodwork. They're the I, best. Well of course they are. Like you know their their work is is even though they, they like their work is is um to say it, it builds on yours as you said it goes it goes to the upper parts of the pyramid and it, it it's it's a part and parcel with anything kind of within the alternative sphere is that you'll have some people who their work is diametrically opposed you've got others with where it's like this is a little too coincidental where it is either built on or it fits well and it's rational and it, it's good to be able to see that that kind of collaboration and you know they're they're fantastic guys so uh, but yeah, like, you know, getting out to Niagara on the lake, it's, it's kind of one of those things where if you're ever out East, they've got fantastic wine. I'm not much of a wine drinker nowadays, but it, it's a good time. You, you go on the tour, you go visit, you know, a, a few places, you chat up the maitre d' at these wineries, they give you extra booze. You stumble back to the hotel wondering what the heck happened. It's great. Fantastic <laughs> times. Fantastic times. My wife would say different. She's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like, Chris, why do you have to keep saying the word tannin so many times? Like, you know, sorry, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like Doug Keenan. I mean, my God, the guy, he has, he he did CAD uh, um, layouts for all the keys of Plateau, all the pyramids. He has it all down to all the details. Mm-hmm. He did a 3D printing print of model of the Giza Plateau and it has the tiniest little sphinx. It's all accurate. It's, it's gorgeous. And he's done the, he's done the the uh the granite blocks for the uh King's Chambers mm-hmm. uh he printed those he's it and his works on now Doug Keenan did Big Sky Map and he his work is the um basically uh uh radar radar projection of the sky to look for um, anomalies. Anyways, that's kind of the best of like um, comments or anything that might impact us. That's my basic understanding. And now I have to give a shout out to this uh, this uh, uh, this one this one fellow uh, George Zuger who who had who <coughs> introduced me to a bunch of Good guys. It's that it's 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 Chris George. I just throw in there. It's my middle name. I mean, oh, I mean, I do Chris it. George. I do it because it sounds cool. Everyone calls me like the amount of times it's like, is Georgie there? I'm like, no, sorry. <laughs> you know? Oh, apologies. No, I you. <laughs> George Howard's work that you you had him on your on a couple of shows. It's George Howard, right? The mammoth. Yes. Yes. Okay, and also. Randall Carlson. Randall. Okay, now, okay, now, I didn't know about their works, and I very much appreciate their works. Mm-hmm. I'm very impressed. So, big shout out to Dan of Lore. I mean, Chris, you've had some really amazing people on there, and it, you exposed me to their knowledge, knowledge base, and they're right. 
They're it's right. it, it it like their their work is like especially when you're dealing with the younger Dryas and oh, like that's yes. an entirely different an, an entire different show just on itself. But like it yes. yeah you know there, there was the the big thing that kept uh, being said over and over again from the opponent's side to their point of view of why it wasn't where it's like those spherical were do- were were bug poop. Bug but it's like I, why why that's the that's, that's the thing that's sticking out in my head it's like okay so the bug poop is everywhere like is it you know like these spherules were found at the black mat layer in multiple sites on several continents and it's not possible that the exact same bug was pooping all over the place at the exact same time when the species may not have existed so you know logically mm, probably not it, and it like it, it is heavily supported, and it's talked about. At least it's being accepted from, uh, you know, like even with with some mainstream uh, acceptance. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole Atlantis because that's an entirely different right, show altogether. Um, but the fact is, at least that there are touches from depending on which school of thought you're from, whether that knowledge, you know, if there was knowledge from a potential hypothetical civilization you know is there some type of knowledge that was carried forward and then used into building the great pyramid and a machine like this the fact that we haven't seen anything else out there it it's it's interesting to say okay well if this was built where did they get the idea from why was it done if this was done to a plan this is a like a multi-millennia plan to build this machine to then build these other pyramids to then you know if we're going on with doug's work to then use that machine to then you know use it for astronomy purposes or for signaling purposes or for for what have you it's it's you know if you look at it from a microcosm it's like okay everything fits but if you look at it over a much longer uh time scale it seems to some people that okay it, it's not very plausible no but is it possible yes it's also possible that you know i could get hit by a bus tomorrow morning stepping out on, on my road where there are no buses but at the same time it's like okay where's the evidence to say one way or another and it's people can produce it but you actually have a working machine so <laughs> How, how how like how how is it people can ignore it when it's when it's right literally right there in front of you? Not sure, not sure. Oh no! One thing I was going to say is, I I actually we have a university in this town, at Western Washington University. I I went there for a few years and and uh, I contacted them. I'm comfortable with the campus and everything like that because I went there and and it's probably. 20 minutes away from this boulder build. And I contacted, literally went in and sat in the in, in the class and talked to the professors of various ancient histories and told my dad and invite them up and and also I figured they'd probably get bite on it since they're professors and stuff. You might want to see this. Nothing on that. And I've also I contacted the physics department years ago, and I zero. I, you know, what about I'm engineers? Stuck. Have you gone to the engineering department and said, "Hey, man, come out to the woods. I got a rock to show you." So it's so the same pyramid, though. <laughs> it's just, it just shuts it down, and they just won't. They won't acknowledge it, and it, it just seems like mm. it's going to be really a, an embarrassment to them when it eventually comes out that. You know, they didn't even do any research or even anything to go 20 minutes away and actually observe and do some ecology things. Now, interesting thing. This is this is from Danny who said a pyramid go and he, he goes and deletes it again. So I actually remember this one. <clears throat> something along the lines of something, something pyramid go bang. The pyramid sends out a pulse yes. and the other pyramid receives it and it can pick up things like let's say an asteroid okay that's cool it is a possibility how would like how, how would they okay so so it's received 
what is that reading then? Like, you know, what is the reading displayed on? How, how are they able to to take that information and then put it into a uh, something that can then be interpreted by somebody? Like, again, for, for us, we use computer screens or people who have Braille have the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the Braille readers that they can then read with their fingertips. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying that in, in a manner of trying to, to disprove it or trying to logic it out of the conversation. But it's just kind of interesting to say, OK, well, if they need to interpret that information, how would they do it? Uh, uh, Beetle dung. <coughs> Beetle dung. No, by, by reading it, by eating it, and then hallucinating about it, do they hook themselves I'm sure that's up? It. Like, do, do they shove it directly up the, you know, uh, up the backside, and it opens up their chakras? Help, help me out here. Well, you know, I, I, back, but anyway, I was in California. That's what we did with it, anyway. So I don't. Know. Man, it was good too. I tell you, it was good. Like, well, the 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 eighties must have been, and I'm, I was gonna say like, oh, the sixties. I'm like, no. That's a little bit too early. That, that, that's insulting. 70s? Eh, probably. I was, I was in the 70s. No, like, okay, like the mid 80s must have been pretty interesting times. It's like everyone's, like everyone's doing, you know, the, the skiing on the White Mountains and we're dealing with beetle dung enemas. That's, you're, you're from Washington, right? Like you were born in that area? I, I, was, I was born in Bellingham, which is here. Okay. Then I was exported for school years by my mom down to down the beach area by uh, LA airport. It was really a great area. Playa del Rey back in the seventies. It was great. It was awesome. It was like just poor surfers down there and it was a great beach. And, and uh, as soon as I graduated high school, um, came back. <laughs> I'm out of here. <clears throat> well, like now that, now that we've gotten the, the, like there's only so many ways I can I can ask, why did you build a pyramid? Like we already answered that question. Like why did you build it? Well, because. Okay, cool. It works. How did you get to the point where you're in school? You're like, okay, I'm out of here, and then you end up on an Alaskan, you know, fishing or a crabbing boat, and then back to Washington State to become an engineer or and to to you know to to build this model. Well, in this area, Bellingham, Seattle, all this area, all the crab boats are, are from here. And so the whole fishing fleet up in Dutch harbors, like all the crew and they, it, it's the college kids go up to Alaska for the salmon seasons for big money, pay for college. So it's just really common to go up there. It's all they've done for ages. And so I, I was just started going up there to pay for college and it was starving and uh and got kind of they saw us smart so they kept going into the engine uh started working with the engineers on the boats instead of just working on processors and stuff and started going to the engine room and working on all the refrigeration electrical stuff and i mean it, it, and power plants and uh, fabrication we, we did everything so i just kind of got i mean I, it was a job and it it, it it paid really well especially at the time and so that kind of did go alaska for a couple months and that paid for pay for school and, and then eventually just kind of got sucked into the engineering on the crab boats because it, 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 it paid ridiculously well at the time it was it, it doesn't translate now well. It's like 15 grand a month was pretty normal. And and for the crowd- That translates pretty well now. No, so it'd be like making like a hundred grand a month in today's money. So that's it. And that's that wouldn't be Canadian, but it's US funds. So, so I know there's exchange. Uh, so it's like a, you know, hundred, yeah. So it, it paid really well. And yeah. It's like okay, you do this for a couple of months and not die, and 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 then you have time off. And you, but then you, they'd want you back on the boat too fast, and you didn't have time to blow the money. You know, you know, strippers and hookers and cocaine to uh, Hawaii. So 
one of the one of the chiefs did that sort of stuff. He's, like, he's probably dead. <laughs> But, you know, it's the stories of how they had to blow as much money as possible during the month they were off. And it says, but, but, um, like, I, yeah, this, this sorry. wasn't really my calling so much. I, not, I mean, I, I wasn't really interested in pyramids, honestly. I just thought it was an overrated pile of rocks. That's was my opinion until started coming across the accuracy, especially Chris Dunn's work on the uh, machined artifacts. His work's phenomenal on the accuracy. It's, I mean, it's space age precision on so many artifacts. And well, it, it, it's not, boxes. well, truth be told, like, you know, and, and this is to, um, I, I'm more of a realist when it comes to the overall uh, engineering feats of, of ancient cultures. It's, I, I, I don't prescribe necessarily to the ancient alien hypothesis with regards to every you know do not know how it was built so must be aliens because i i believe in the uh, the ingenuity of man and and man being human not you know men women in terms of just being able to figure things out the accuracy for the fact that they were still using bronze metals for a majority of their construction and weaponry uh to get that close to a true north is impressive um if it were a and you know to anybody else out there yeah you know i think graham hancock was right with, with in regards to if they was space aliens it would have been bang on true north it's off by a couple of degrees so even for that the fact that they did that with string um you know some sticks and uh, you know whatever <laughs> you know whatever they built for com uh, for compasses back then that's that's impressive like you know I, I i have a hard time trying to be able to butter my toast <laughs> evenly in the morning so <laughs> the fact that they did this five thousand years ago yeah i, I gotta say that's kind of a, a a testament to what our species is capable of doing right I, I i'm going with the it was just a previous civilization it was people as humans um and it was just hit you know, we're hit by the comet younger driest it's pretty obvious that there was a huge event that, you know, the black rat event, and it, it pretty much wiped out most of humanity. And and like the Netflix series of Graham Hancock's, where he had a friend of Carlson, and you know that was it. Uh, Pot folks or that's it. I, I can't think of the name of it right off hand, but you know, it just it it shows that you know, from all angles that we were, you know, we're, we're flooded. We're flooded now still 500 feet. Um, but it was just an ancient, so it was a civilization that was wiped out. And, and the pyramids are just remnants of that. It, it, there was, there was mach, there's machine artifacts. It's the, if nothing else, the bull boxes of the Serapian, if nothing else, there's 13 of them, they're optical precision to within two, what are they, 11 feet by 13 feet by eight feet, uh, machined out of uh, uh, single pieces of uh, granite that came from somewhere else and they're underground. And Chris Dunn took his ultra precision you know the right angles, the squares, and and the straight edges, and it's it's optical precision. Like it's it's these are machined artifacts, and so it was from a previous civilization a civilization that got wiped out. Younger guys, event. Oh, do you think it's possible that it's not necessarily machined, but people who had a lot of time on their hands with nothing no. else to do and no. just, you know, years and years of expertise. Oh, nope. optical precision. It's, it's, it, it, he, he, he puts a, you know, straight edge up against, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the box, grant box and shines a flashlight and there's no light that goes in between this ultra precision, you know, straight edge. That's, you you can't even you couldn't do that with anything. I think you could. 
I, I think if, if somebody's job for 20 years was, okay, your entire job for 20 years is to work on this one side. No, no, no you can do it, can do it, can do it. It's like body work. You're not going to do optical precision, even with with Bondo and stuff. You're not. Uh, no, do... I know people who go, I know people who can. My my late uncle was a master body worker, and the, the what he could do with Bondo was very yeah, impressive. We're, we're getting optical precision though, and it was great. Well, it, optical like, precision is two two one two one hundred thousandths of an inch in a two foot span. That's like one. Well, we're, we're, we're making supposition. Like I'm saying it's possible. Is it likely? I don't know. I wasn't there to, you know, th uh, three, 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago when it was built. I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm, I'm of the mind that if you get a master builder, getting close to perfection when that's literally all you do every single day, if it takes you 20 years to even, let's say, let, let's say you've got 10 people who are working on one box or, you know, let's see, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's say you get nine, nine master craftsmen who for 20 years, their entire job is to get one side as perfect as possible. And that's literally all they do. I would think that if they're taking their time and they're using the proper tools and the proper measurements and they've got the proper technique, they would get that kind of precision if they were to take that long to be able to do it. Because even even we don't necessarily know how long it took them to be, uh, how long it took, how many people worked on it, you know what what can what construction techniques we're 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 basing our um uh you know our uh, perspectives from what we know is possible and trying to be able to project it on the workmanship from twenty you know for, from from millennia ago. And I'm saying that it, you know, it, is it possible that Chris Dunn is right and that the, that it was machined? Yeah, it's it is possible. It is is it, or are we talking about electrically powered machines? They could have had something that was, you know, human powered. They could have had techniques or tools that uh, would get very close to that precision. Maybe it would take a lot longer. You know, you're not dealing with three or four thousand or ten thousand or twenty thousand RPM, but. You know, there, there, there are still techniques and tools that can be used. I'm just saying it's, it's possible. Right. I, 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 I follow you for that argument. I completely rely. Hey, well, you know, we're, we're, I, 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 I can't cater to that. <clears throat> I, I can't cater to really. I, I'm just not. Well, again, I'm, all, I'm also the guy asking questions. I'm the interviewer. You're, you're the actual engineer. You build the stuff. I'm the one asking you how this stuff is built. So, so I, worked, I worked in a machine shop in mm -hmm. high school and stuff. And so, you know, I have a pretty good idea of tolerances. And, you know, work with, Doug is you saying know, water powered. That makes a little bit more sense. It's like, you know. You, you could do a water power yeah. sort of sort of machine to spin some stuff and, and grind and all. But still, you need absolutely straight bed for the tooling to go on and so you have to make an absolutely straight bed for the tooling to go on and, and that's one thing that chris is always saying okay you know you need to have the, the straight bed at, ahead of time that's absolutely precise and we're talking precision to the point of of where just the heat from tooling would change enough tolerances that we start getting variances in the in the tooling itself and that's absent. It's, it's the precision's, it's grand. It's grand. You know, it's, <laughs> and it's huge. And the, and the tops of, and the walls are parallel. The top fits absolutely perfectly where it's absolute perfect right angle. So they're absolutely parallel sides in something that, you know, 10 people can easily fit in. And it's a single block and it was done underground that way. Oh, that's, that's... You know, as long as we're not talking that they will the rock to shape itself. No, no, you know, no, no, the no, no, no willing of the rock. No, it's, it's just, I mean, you can do it with the, with the right equipment. Well, it's, it's like with anything else, if you got the right tool for the job. But even, even like, I, I think back to, you know, my uncle, uh, you know, may rest in peace, 
he was a master woodworker. And the stuff that he could do with, a, you know, a hammer, chisel, and, um, you know, a planer, you know, I, I wouldn't understand how he did it. You'd be able to join two pieces of wood together so that they would appear to be one piece without any, uh, you know, noticeable joining in between. You know, my, my dad would talk about stuff like that his brother could do when we were working on stuff. And he's like, oh, man, like if, if you know, like my brother were here, he'd be able to fix this up and it, you wouldn't even notice that it was two pieces of wood. I'm thinking, like, how the hell you know, did, would, would he be able to do that? But he'd been also doing it for, for 50 years. Um, you know, what I didn't real like, I didn't know what tools would be available, whether it be hand tools or whether it be power tools. So, like, I, I look at things like that. I'm, you know, I, I look at the, the basics of what could be available. And I don't necessarily think about, okay, well, what, what would they have had? And also, we're, we're talking about thousands of years ago you know, like so like some of the tools we haven't found, is it under sand? Is it buried somewhere else in a tomb somewhere? Was it taken out to another, you know, another site and lost? You know, was it only certain people that had access to these things? Like, these are all questions, you know, we don't, like we think we know, but we don't know. Like, right. we, we, you know, we, we, can, we, can have, we can have ideas about it, but at the end of the day, whether it's us, whether it's, it's uh, you know, uh, archaeologists, we're making the best guesses based on the information that we have available to us that we can see in front of our eyes or the things that we found. But you even factor in, uh, and I brought this, this point up, uh, uh, you know, two weeks ago when I was talking with Denver, you know, the, we, we look at the fossil, and I'm, I'm, you know, obviously trying to equate fossils with tools is, is two different things, but we don't even have a necessary, like a full picture of the fossil record because the fossilization of two of, of bones requires a very specific, uh, environment. So, you know, for metal, yeah, that, that's going to last for a very long time unless it's, it's something that can rust. And then if it's going to rust, it's going to oxidize and will it go back to dust or, or, or what have you, if it's steel, it could be around, if it's bronze, that kind of thing. If they're only finding certain tools are more advanced tools, buried even you know deeper is it underneath the sand you know the sphinx had been buried up to its neck a few times so and that was over just a couple hundred years if they didn't spontaneous or if they didn't continuously maintain the sphinx the desert would retake it so uh, you know that that that's the thing i at least i want to be able to 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 pose to anybody else out there i'd be interested to see what the tools they use but obviously they haven't shown that no tools that up. <clears throat> no, there was one video um i forget i honestly do not remember the channel it was on but there were trying to recreate some of the crafts uh like crafting techniques for the bowls or you know some of the pottery and, and how they were shaping stone whether it was like using foot foot pedaled uh, uh drilling machines or buffing machines um, and they were able to get some pretty interesting results out of that. But I also like think back to this one video uh, and again, my memory escapes me when it comes to half the time, when it comes to half of the, uh, YouTube video channel names out there, because it's like some random name with like seven, seven, seven next to it. And somebody's trying to make like a, a hand drill and they'll make three different hand drills. Uh, and some will be more effective than others. Some will be. Like, okay, there's too much friction. That doesn't, that, you know, style wouldn't work. This one would produce more, uh, you know, akin to uh, like a power drill, but it would take much longer. Um, like how, if you were to, and just, just spitballing here, like if you were to look at uh, the techniques that were potentially used, if you only had hand tools available to you and you said, okay, well, it's got to be as close to perfect as possible. How would you go about doing that? I have no idea. I just I, I I don't I don't know how you even get. You, you, I mean, you could, but just handfuls. You could you, you'd have to make some sort of diamond cutting blades out of something. You know, if, if you're looking at exactly what the materials they had for. Let's say forty five hundred BC, whenever they say the pyramid was built and stuff. 
you know, if if there, if if we're talking about like powered, whether it's you know it, whether it's more advanced, you know, water powered as as Doug had mentioned, or if we're using like some type of hand powered that could produce a very high RPM, like it, how do you think they'd be able to to produce a diamond tipped tool at that point? I, I'm I'm actually like honestly asking because I don't even know how we would do it nowadays. It's it's not my expertise. So they say, oh, it's a diamond tip saw. How do they make the diamond tip saw? <laughs> if, 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 if they were just using straight what the the basic history says, they just they'd use copper. They could use like a copper and then and they just uh, embed diamond grit, you know, rough diamonds into the into the surface of the uh, of the blade, and then they could if they just want to be cutting, then they just use that as a cut. Uh, that'd be one way to do it. That's a simple assembly, uh, or you could, or or if you do like core, do core drills. You could, you know, use diamonds instead. Of, well, if if you're doing a core drill and you had diamonds, like diamonds aren't affected by heat up until like you you gotta have to like real real hot to be able to, to affect a diamond. So like, would they be able to actually like include that within the smelting process for the copper? I have no idea. No, oh. it might be able to. That'd be that'd be slick. I mean, it'd be it'd be a, a a nice tool. It would it would it would cut through stuff. Mm -hmm. But I guess there is no actual signs of diamonds there. But there's diamonds in Africa. I can't discount any of that. And there's obviously copper. There's copper's on the record there. And yeah, copper tools. I'm, I'm it was before it's before the Bronze Age, so I. I'm thinking back to this, like one, like t talking about, you know, creating very weird cutting utensils. There's this one Japanese YouTube channel, and I don't don't know the name of it for the life of me. But the guy will make knives out of anything. It's like oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'll make a chocolate knife, and he'll somehow use chocolate to develop a blade, and he'll sharpen it, and he'll show how it cuts, and it's 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 very. Uh, it's it's cool because he's done stuff with like bismuth and and what have you, and I'm just talking <laughs> just to be able to show you how long of a day I've had, like talking about like oh like diamond encrusted you know boring copper tools. I'm like I'm kind of hungry now because <laughs> I'm thinking about the knives, like oh my goodness I need a snack. Um, so if this type of of construction would have been done either through powered or hand tools like again like we're talking semantics at this point for for the type of of um chamber that we're dealing with here on a large scale how long do you think it would take for somebody to be able to bore this like to be able to bore this out even if you got a couple thousand people like is this something that you think would have been done over like a short amount of time or are we talking like you know centuries are we talking progressively improved upon like in, in terms of like for all the time you spent building models how, how do you think that they would have gone about doing this in stages through generations if, if you're just talking about like the bull boxes themselves I, i'm not sure which artifacts you're, you're well i was actually talking about the the subterranean chamber oh i no i, I don't know how they did it uh it'd take forever and and i don't know how the heck they managed to bore down at a 26 degree angle just for the descending passage for 330 feet and uh it's laser straight how do you how do you do a three foot shaft it's the angle's the prop so if you get like a 26 degree angle and to keep and to hold it and like chip down forward at a specific angle not waver at all i don't know how you do it it'd be awful is there they're saying they just have, you know, people with like chipping rocks and this is really silly stuff. And, and, and then you wouldn't have any air and be dusty and, and the guys pounding in front of them going at it. See, the thing is, if, you, if you're doing vertical shafts or horizontal shafts, that's completely different. You can do that. You know, you've got gravity. And, and gravity and water and stuff. So you can you could level and you, you can bore straight down. You just hang it. You can't, but 26 degree angle, you don't hang something. You have to, 
have something that kind of goes at that angle. And then you've got gravity, you got like it dangling and flex and it's laser straight. It's within what's it, a hundredth of an inch over a, or a tenth of an inch over a hundred foot stretch. I did that that's a descending passage. It's it's laser straight. I, I don't know that like a very large protractor, I'm guessing. I, I you still have to you got this angle, you gotta keep going down and like you gotta get the stuff out past this. I mean, all I ever hear about people that walk down that that 300 foot, it's like, you know, it's a football field. Down that at is three foot square. They hate going down, just going down there, walking down it. Walk down backwards and stuff. Jeez, I'm not here yet. These guys are like chipping stuff and and bagging up this little bit of dust they're chipping out. And there's no air because you got no airflow and no lights because you don't really have electric lights and stuff. And if you're yeah, sitting out at the top, you fall, you're going all the way down to the bottom. So like there, there's nothing to stop you. Yeah, so it's I don't know how they did it. I couldn't do it. Oh, no. Now, like, it, it, almost impossible, almost impossible task. Now, like, do you think the, the, like, do you think the whole, like, we don't know, um, idea of, like, being able to say, like, oh, I don't know how this was done. And we're, we're trying to be able to figure things out. And we will a lot of the time, uh, and I said, like I mentioned before, impose our own, um, you know, perspectives and, and experiences on to, to certain solutions. And it's great to have that kind of perspective and, and knowledge because like, you know, we've got a few thousand years of uh, uh, collective knowledge that we can pull from to try and solve those problems. Um, but, but do you think like with the way information's being presented nowadays and the ease it is to be able to reject certain ideas because of uh, you know, our, our faster society. Do you think like that's more of a, an obstacle in terms of trying to discover how a lot of these things were made? I don't know if how all this stuff is made is even, even matters. To be honest. I want to see what the function is. Spoken like a true engineer. This is, this is, da this is data collection. This, we're doing data collection. You know, you know, it's not about well, you know. Uh, it's it's good to get they, the philosophical. How they, through, how, how they chip through rocks and stuff. I mean, whatever. <laughs> you know, different ways. It, well, well, it's going to. It, it's good this, to get a, it's, it's good. A machine, it's a machine. It's proven. I mean, it's it's replicable. You, all you do take Giza, replicate it on any scale. You know the the subterranean section, and it will work. So anybody, and I've always offered that to anybody. Just follow what's there. It will work. Don't, I don't, I'm not giving you any secret knowledge or stuff. I, it's all out there. There's, I show the valves and stuff. It's like, well, if, if, this, I, if I don't ask the philosophical <laughs> questions, you yeah. know, there, there's some, yeah. some people in the audience who are like, oh, like Chris is back and he's not asking, like, he's not asking some way out of left field question of the engineer who's just like, I just build the cool stuff, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> want, I want to test. I want to test the machine and see what these really smart, high-tech people, what they were doing. Why did they put a perfect vortice in there? Why? They absolutely made it. And that's a prime. Yeah, it's just absolutely that's critical. Perfect. It's yeah. critical. And it's and it's it's like it, it's like the most beautiful tornado vortice. It's that mm -hmm. clean. It's perfect. And it, it and it's Fibonacci's 3D Fibonacci spiral vortex. Yep, I do. I do recall yeah. that. That that, like that was that. kind of one of the big things where it's like the golden ratio fits in, you know, in in the chamber. Yeah. So, I just want to. I personally, I just I wanted to start putting ink through it and see what this vortice does because it in nature it does seem to um, amplify things pretty aggressively. You know, like at the like the tornado. It's what was it? They, at the, they recorded 320 mile an hour, the highest wind speed ever going into the tornado of uh, a couple of them down in Oklahoma. How, 
That's higher than Antarctic wind speeds. That's higher than any wind speeds <clears throat> ever recorded. That's, and they recorded it. It's like, so vortices are, I wanna see what vortices do and what sort of amplifications they do and apply it in real, for real stuff, like maybe spinning a generator or something, something real. I, I, I'm, I'm not into like so much the, you know, how they chip the rock out and breathe and how's their light. It's like, I don't really care. I, I, want, I want to do cool stuff. I want to, you I want a vortice to spin uh, like a Pelton wheel or something at extreme speeds and, and, you know, amplify it so I can put a generator on the end and, and I'll sell back to the grid or, or this powerhouse or something. It's 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 very high tech, and I and I, that's what I want to see. That's that's my jam. Now let let's like I, I know we're getting. I guess a classic. What is I, it? I, I, I've got a question. There, okay. step in here finally. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've been. I don't know. I, I, He's I, built, he did most of the inside of the yeah, model. I, I, you know, I I've had to sit and okay. look at this model, and he's got and, model on the brain. And go <laughs> for it. Um, I've had to sit. And I've I've watched John's research and and I I know more about this this room than I care to ever know about really. Uh, and I've done a lot of uh, watching of videos that people have been very generous on providing us with, so that uh, the model can become more accurate accurate because there isn't an awful lot of pictures there isn't an awful lot of information about this room that's out there that we were able to glean from so as uh, gopros have come in and people are able to take pictures and videos of the the subterranean chamber that we can actually look at and uh learn more about this subterranean chamber it's helped uh make it possible for modifying and making the actual model more accurate than it has been from 1999 i mean the first uh, model was a little bit rough and i've i've been along for the journey and it's been a very interesting journey but I've also learned a lot about this room and about the, the shafts and everything else, which uh, that's, that's just John's work. It's, it's not mine, but I, I, I enjoy the, the journey with him. But you've asked how a lot. How could he do this? How could he do that? The, the biggest question is why? Why would they? carve this channel at 26 degrees angle perfectly down there that's a good point. why would they carve all this room at these perfectly smooth uh within uh, thousands of an inch of being perfectly straight the, all the the questions were how doesn't really matter it's why would they do all this work all of this i mean anybody can I mean, we look at the automotive industry. Our industry is not very accurate. I mean, you look at what people build in the United States. It's it's people don't build things that are precisionly accurate. And this it has to be like computers or something like that, and they are precision accurate. And you go, why? Why build this room so perfect when it's 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 going to be a machine? The walls, the shafts, everything are, I mean, Chris has done a lot of research on it. And he's it's amazing research and, and information that come back to us. And it's, and he keeps saying, God, everything is so, I mean, the right angles and this, and this, and this are all, you know, really close to being perfectly accurate. Why? Uh, because if I, I, I my, my, the reason I hadn't asked that as much is because if they didn't do it to that level of precision or didn't do it at those angles, it wouldn't work. And then you wouldn't have the pulse generation coming from from that chamber towards the upper part of the pyramid. That would be the only reason why they would have done it. 
because uh, the calculations would have been to at least like it, logically logically to me it would just be based around the fact that if they didn't do it that way it's not going to work to the same effect you're not going to get the same uh you know like the, the same pressure you're not going to get the same resonance you're not going to get the same uh, you know the 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 same volume um now why they would need it at that you know that's that's a very good question that's that's yeah. that's well beyond well beyond my expertise <laughs> it's well beyond my expertise and and this room has literally driven me crazy just thinking about all the little idiosyncrasies that are in this room from the little blocks that are going down the channels to the angle of this the little carving out of that which i've had to uh work with john as far as replicating with a with the tools that we have available and you just go jesus why does this have to be here why what was their mindset and you can make things not perfectly accurate and they do work but they work very hard at making it so accurate that it's it's just it's stupefying to me well then i would say at least <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> on that note because we, we are coming up to the end of two hours i'm like right. We're going to do a part two sometime in the late spring where we get to interview you and then we can actually talk about the why. I think that that would be a cool follow up. Uh, it's, just, it's like it's like the Lagina brothers. It's a Cadman brothers. I'm telling you, <laughs> the Lagina brothers are they're they got a lot more resources, but we're 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 all slow. <laughs> That's all I know. So hey. when we come back in the spring for part two, we're going to have this running. It's it's almost ready, and be I can't wait to see that. Filming. That's that's it another reason why, because I actually yeah, want to be able to see that. I want to show people it working, it, and be able to show off the work. Because I, I I know it it's it, it's a, it's a it's a point of pride for any engineer to show their machine functioning the way that it should be. And I know the fact you've been working very hard on the ink injection, and I think it'd be yeah. cool to be able to actually see that firsthand live it's, it's on the dead so, of war. I'm I'm excited about seeing it run. First, see, this is the first time I've seen it actually pulse with ink in it. I've mm. never seen it, and I want to see what it's doing. And it, I'm excited about it. Well, then, I know, you know well, I know where all the ink goes and all that <laughs> stuff. It's really cool. But our <coughs> team will have will have like actual different color inks. You'll be able to inject at different places, and uh, you know, and you'll see. All the the three it's a three dimensional water flow too. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, so part two, we'll have this running, ink running, ink running, and uh, and my head's back in the screen. <laughs> and then 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 I can ask more why questions. Yes, Again, you can ask lots of why <laughs> questions. And I've and, been... I've been and, out of the game for a couple of years, guys. I'm I'm getting back into the mode, so it's it's not that I'm expecting you know s softball uh, uh, guests on. I invited my you know, people that I consider my friends and I care about back on because it's like I know them well enough that I can't f up too badly. <laughs> but at not, least I'm getting back not, into practice. Oh, we're friendly. We're friendly, and we're not from Coos Bay. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> <clears throat> that's that's that there, there goes my monetization for this video i <clears throat> just, just threw up a little bit here <laughs> it's like us saying like damn cornwallers <clears throat> i've got friends from cornwall too. it's a great town <sighs> so ladies and gents uh it's midnight on the east coast and well what, what time is it there 9 p.m 9? 9 p.m on the west coast uh, this has been another episode of Den of Lore. I will have the new announcement for... Actually, I can tell you what everyone... Who, who do we have? Sorry, I, I've been in, like, recovering and in bed uh, the last week. As you can tell, my voice has been gone, so I'm, I'm glad it uh, has been up to the task tonight for the most part. Next week... What's today? Is the 10th? My goodness, it even has the 10th here. Oh, actually, uh, <laughs> we've got uh, uh, Rocky Stucci on next week, and we're going to be talking paranormal and podcasting. Uh, 
that is going to be a good episode. And I know that we also do have the week after that, which that, that will be the 16th is, is Rocky. And, uh, the week after that is William Pullen. We're going to be talking UFOs and the current going ons within, uh, the ufology community. Uh, not for any other reason than it's just bloody entertaining. And <laughs> he always has the best stories to tell. So I know William has been out in the audience. There we go. So, yeah, so, so, uh, you know, same bad. Well, exactly. And it's like, this is the whole, the whole purpose of this show now is it's not being so deep down the rabbit hole. It's just like, it's just talking to interesting people to learn some cool shit as the tagline is and to have a good time and yeah. to be as, uh, you know, just supportive as a community as possible. So ladies and gents, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will catch you all next week. Get some rest. Have a blast. Have a good weekend. And I'm trying to bring up the end stream and good night. <laughs> and, and now, now we're offline.